A very good day to you all. Welcome to Wall Street Blockchain Alliance latest global webinar on the brink market challenges and the future of crypto. Global market turmoil, accelerating regulatory enforcement and recent bank failures have pushed crypto markets to the brink of what many believe is an existential crisis. Today, our panel of experts will discuss the current state of crypto, uh, what's really happening with these bank failures that we've been chatting about for the past 15 minutes on the panel, uh, the impact of regulatory actions and what we might see in the future and far, far and much, much more. Uh, before we begin, begin a bit of housekeeping. Please keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded. Panelists, we've got a lot to cover. Let's keep it succinct. Um, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. Attendees, you are encouraged to submit your questions, <coughs> pardon me, using the Q&A function. And we will, of course, reserve some time at the end to answer those questions. Please keep in mind that this event is offered only for educational informational purposes only and does not constitute accounting, investment, legal, or tax advice, thanks to all of my lawyer friends. Uh, and please also keep in mind that any views or opinions expressed during this event are the views of the participants and do not necessarily reflect their own firms or that of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance or our board. With that, I've got a bunch of good friends and great colleagues and thought leaders in this space. I wanted to do a quick round of introductions um, let's start. Dina, tell us who you are. Tell you, tell us who you work for and say hello to the audience, please. Sure. Um, I work for Paul Hastings in the fintech practice, and I spent most of my career working on house financial services, Senate banking and treasury, uh, going back to Graham Leach Bliley. And I, I'll, I'll make this comment that's relevant and then I, I will um, stop. I actually was the person that handled subprime lending uh then called predatory lending back in 1999 um but i've always been in house or um, on the hill and was not able to really speak about it you can now dina thank you for joining us josh over to you hi thanks for having me today i'm josh clayman among other things um at the wsba um i have since 2016 led the legal working group um, which is full, chock full of, you know, hundreds of, of the best lawyers, in my view, in the space. Um, and I'm also on the WSBA's board. And separately, I'm also at Linklaters, where I'm U.S. head of FinTech and head of blockchain and digital assets. And I work out of the New York office. Josh, thanks so much. Mr. Brill, old friend. Great to see everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm David Brill. I'm the chair of the Crypto Assets Working Group here at WSBA. Uh, I've been in the financial services and technology space over 20 years and in crypto since 2016. And I just finished up a stint as the former deputy general counsel at Voyager Digital. And I am an arbitrator for GBAT, among the other things I'm involved in. And very happy to be here today. David, thanks so much. And our friend, Mr. Cohen. Uh, Ron, thank you so much for having me. Lewis Cohen here, co-founder of DLX Law. We are a law firm that is active in the crypto asset and blockchain space, and great to be here. Thank you all for joining, really appreciate it. I wanna level set, and David, uh, I'd like to start with you, and you and I have this conversation, I feel like either virtually or, or by telephone call, almost on a daily basis. Let's do the quick recap of current events. When we did the prep session, it was, what happened to Silvergate? What happened to S SVB? Now we keep adding names. What happened to Signature Banks? People keep texting me this morning about Credit Suisse. Give us lay that foundation, David, for us, and let's we make these very conversational. Let's open that up for the rest of the panel as well. What has happened to the banking ecosystem, and what is the intersection with crypto? David, you want to kick us off? Sure. So, look, I think in the first instance, in the last year, we've had 400 basis points of increases in our lending rates from the Federal Reserve, and this has had a knock-on effect with our banks, and in particular, when you look at Silvergate you look at Silicon Valley Bank, they were unprepared in the last year to handle this duration mismatch. And what I mean is they had a lot of short-term deposits from their account holders. They had account concentration, but they had a lot of longer term duration bonds and securities. And what this caused is a liquidity issue for both of those banks where they could not sell enough securities on their, in their positions in their portfolio to support the massive amount of withdrawals they had. So we, we've had what we would call the first real digital bank run. And these duration mismatches played a key role in it. So what I would tell you is this really started about a year ago with these rate increases. 
and led to these banks having issues where I believe in Silvergate's case, they couldn't file their 10Q, which caused concern. And then in SVB's case was taking a large loss on their crypto, on their, sorry, loan portfolio, which created instability in those banks and then concerns. The one thing I will say is at first, I think the media was portraying this as sort of a crypto issue and banks that were banking crypto companies. But I think as we've seen now and today with you know, Credit Suisse, this is a more sort of systemic issue regarding management of risk and how banks have handled the large increase of Fed increases over the last year. So, well, I could go on for 20 minutes. That's my <laughs> succinct version of it. David, thanks. I want to open that up to the group as well. And, and I, I want to throw this out there kind of as a tangent to what David is talking about. There's this popular um, narrative, particularly on Capitol Hill. So Dina, we're definitely going to have to bother you with this, that crypto started this. This is really bad. Um, I, I, I want to throw that out there. Is that really the case? We know we know about Silvergate, right? We understand that. But uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong. SVB wasn't the biggest crypto banker in the country. Neither was Signature, as I recall. Uh, and Josh, you had mentioned a bit earlier that New York specifically came out and said that Signature, I believe it was, wasn't rolled up because of crypto. Who wants to kick that off? Tell us about that narrative and why why it's false. Or is it false? Dina, you can go. I, mean, I feel it. I, I can't, well, here's what I would say. Um, I would say that when it comes to Capitol Hill, the way things are kind of dividing up mostly right now, it has been that the 2018 regulatory relief bill was the cause of the failures. And then uh, there's some Republicans who are saying it was caused by the ESGs. Sorry, Dina, let, Dina let me interject there. Why, why though? What specifically about the Regulatory Relief Act? For the oh, because um, the Regulatory Relief Act um, uh, made changes to Dodd-Frank with the main one being uh, you had to, if you were $50 billion or over as a bank, you were automatically considered systemically important. Um, you know, that was kind of crazy for some of the smaller banks, uh, in what Midwest, or I don't want to name names, but, and so the main thing that the Reg Relief Bill did um, was to take that up to $250 million. Um, so when I, so Silicon Valley Bank, um, I have to be honest with you, um, when I heard that it failed, um, I was in shock because um, because it had so many deposits over 250,000, which I spent most of my career on the banking and retail finance side and had worked on deposit insurance reform. So that just sounded very different. And, um, and I would say maybe, the mismatch that David talked about, and and uh, lastly, the lack of diversity um, in terms of the portfolio at, at um, Silicon Valley Bank. Dina, thanks. Josh, Lewis, do you want to weigh in on that? What are your perspectives on SVB? Yeah, I mean, I think just building on what David and Dina have said, in addition to a maturity and duration mismatch, I mean, the, the effects of the rising interest rates you know, that has, as the rates go up, the fixed income, fixed income bond values go down, right? And that's a lot of what SVB had been investing in, it appears. <clears throat> um, so I think it's, it's that kind of pressure as rates go up, and it's been called out in the media in a few places, you know, also VCs and other people who may have had their money at SVB may have needed more access to their money, right? Because as rates go up, you know, things become more expensive. So there's all kinds of different mismatches. But I think it is really important just to remember, and I think this panel has done a great job so far of, of reminding us, these are commercial banks, right? Crypto, while we may think it's the center of the universe, it's just a small percentage of what these banks do. I mean, Signature has a large footprint or had a large footprint in terms of commercial real estate um, and low income real estate. Um, and I think also Silicon Valley, as we know, VCs, startups generally. And I think even as we we have seen some turmoil that people have pointed to in the crypto markets of late, I mean, we have to remember most startups fail, right? Holding aside crypto, most startups fail. So we can't let that color everything that's that's necessarily been happening. Um, what I would say, and then I'll then I'll zip it for for my turn for now, 
is just as as one of you noted, you know, New York DFS, interestingly, after Barney Frank said, hey, this stuff with um, with Signature, it's related potentially to crypto. That's a paraphrase, obviously. New York DFS said, oh, no, no, no. This had to do with our lack of confidence in management. And they actually pointed out in a quote that Reuters um, published that, you know, New York DFS has well-working crypto laws that have been being applied for years now and is a model for, for the country. That's not a direct quote. Can I just say one sentence and then let Go. Lewis talk? So um, the other thing that I thought right away when I was when I um, heard about Silvergate, that was the first one I heard about, obviously, was the, um, the irony of it, because um, my prediction has always been that the Federal Reserve was going to st step in and designate potentially stable coins as systemically important. So the fact that a Fed regulated um, institution that has regular examinations would fail, it was like just shocking to me. Dina, thanks. Lewis, let's let's give you a little bit of airtime here. We'd love your perspectives on that. And to, to Dina's point, uh, Lewis, to the extent you're comfortable speaking to it, is it fair to complain a bit about the banking mix of clients? And the reason I say that is, SVB focused very specifically on technology startups and kind of the startup ecosystem in Silicon Valley. There are community banks in the Midwest that would not be focusing on that. And the core of their client base is agriculture, for example. So, so weigh in a little bit on this perspective from the bank uh, in the banking space. Yeah, I think sometimes people get a little tangled up in, in what crypto has to do with anything. The, the crypto are not assets. These are not credit exposures on these banks. Um, what uh, Silvergate in particular had was quite a lot of crypto deposits, both in terms of uh, the cash portion of the assets supporting stable coins and then other uh, crypto monies. The problem for banks, of course, is that they need to have a certain uh, ratio of liabilities uh, to assets. And um, with the sudden withdrawal of deposits, um, they had too many assets for their the, the liability side of the balance sheet and had to sell assets and were not in a position, as the other panelists have noted, um, uh, practically to sell without a loss. Um, the issue really is, in my mind, um, if we want to have dollar-backed uh, stable coins, uh, where do you put the dollars? Because um, right. they are different from more traditional um, deposits, which are tend to be relatively sticky. What we saw, though, with SVB is that this is not a unique problem uh, with uh, deposits relating to uh, stable coins or other crypto businesses. Uh, you know, the tech deposits turned out to be flighty, too. So the issue really is what is the a bank model that sort of works? Because if you have to keep, you know, a, a huge amount of capital to cover sudden withdrawals of, you know, flighty deposits, then you're not going to be able to make any money. And so I think there's a more fundamental issue at play here in the banking sector that's going to have to be addressed. Can I mention that? So there's there's an irony to this whole event. So Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, was the heart of innovation, holding venture capital and working with tech companies. But um, part of the reason that Silicon Valley Bank failed um, was because of Twitter and tech. Um, and there was this menta herd mentality of people just, um, it was a bank run, um, people panicking. In bank terms runs. of, sorry, in go ahead. The, the reason I was shocked about, again, about the level of um, the, I think it will be a question going forward in terms of um, if you're over to the 250,000 limit. Um, traditionally, you see, um, you know, their banks will use sweep accounts or money market funds or other cash management tools. And I, I, I do think this will be a subject of many conversations. Louis, Dina, thanks so much on that point. I wanted to, and I don't want to make this an entire bank seminar because there's a lot more to cover in the crypto space, but I do want to add one last point there. And without naming anything, but do we suspect that this is the end of the bank contagion? Will there be others? And what do you all think about this kind of de facto waiving of the $250,000 per account FDIC insurance? What happens to the banking system and what happens to crypto's on ramp to that in a case where there's no limit to how much will be backstop and insured by the federal government? Wow, the, those are meaty questions, Ron. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> those, mean, uh, yes. <laughs> those are really meaty questions. I, I would say, Ron, that, you know, the, 
the backstopping was necessary. I don't think everybody fundamentally may agree with it on whether it be moral hazard grounds of other grounds. Mm. But at this time and at this moment, it was necessary. And why it was necessary is that it really was necessary to stop contagion. As you've seen from the follow on with a number of other community banks that are having issues with rapid withdrawals, if the, you know, if the Fed and the FDIC had not stepped in, many other regional banks would have suffered waves of withdrawals. And we really could have had you know, several other banks fall in this current week. Mm. So what I would say is, do people like it? Is there a moral hazard? Potentially there is, but in light of the circumstances, it was necessary. And then on top of it, you're seeing what's happening with Credit Suisse today. So I, I think it was necessary. And, and, and I got, was, you have to give the regulators credit for this. And then, I, Dean, I don't want to let you go. Sorry. I, I think there were... was. I would say it was necessary. Um, but and they're saying taxpayers won't be on the hook. Um, but the uh, the DIF uh, deposit insurance fund will need um, you know banks to pay more into the system, and some banks that are community banks that had no part of this at all. The second thing I will say is that people haven't really said. When I heard about Silicon Valley Bank failing and the role that it plays into innovation and startups, I this is uh, innovation is the heart of um, of the U.S. Um, and financial services is the circulatory system. So I also had this fe uh, fear of um, this bank failing because of all of the innovation, including health saving types of um, drugs and biotech and those kind of things. Dina, and thanks. David, do you want to finish that? I'm sorry, Josh. I just want David to finish that sentence he had and then Josh will go to you and Lois. Okay. You know, it, it's it's fine. We can go on. I, okay. I think just, just basically what I was saying is that, you know, now that you see what's going on with Credit Suisse and other banks that are selling off that, I, I want to give the regulators credit. I think that while they were late to the party and regulating the banks, and examining the banks, we do need to give them credit for spending the weekend and making a plan and implementing it. So I do want to give credit to to maybe late to the party, but doing something when they got to the party. I, I think you're very kind to regulators in some perspectives, David, or at least from other people's viewpoints. Josh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. I know you wanted to add something. So I just want to play a little bit of devil's advocate, right? Not that I necessarily feel this way, but I think it's important to, to share this view. You know, some of the loudest voices on Twitter and and Twitter spaces and, and other types of news media and social media um, beyond that were basically yelling fire in a crowded theater, right? Saying, oh, people are going to be lined up around the black thing, I mean, around the block, right? Trying to withdraw. It's, it's going to just be failure after failure if you don't backstop. But a lot of those loudest voices were people who had money in the accounts in excess of $250,000. So it has been said by some um, that perhaps some of the VCs and others um, were applying pressure and, you know, had the benefit of having, I shouldn't just say VCs, but, you know, depositors had the benefit of having loud enough voices that it actually could cause the harm that one otherwise might try to prevent. And it's interesting that some of the very loud voices weren't advocating calm. They were advocating, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. And we'll never know at this point. Maybe the sky would have fallen. It's totally possible that, for example, Signature would have had a run on it um, in on, on Monday morning. We you certainly could, saw some. You could push back on that a little bit, Josh, as well. And I, you know, I hate to do this, but to, Dina, to your point earlier, you're right, bank runs in the 21st century happen much more rapidly than they ever did before. When you have sitting senators and representatives again going to Twitter and saying, hey, they failed because of crypto, bad, everything bad, they probably did illegal stuff, that is not helpful dialogue vis-a-vis -vis the banking system. I was gonna say one more thing. Um, I, you know, This is a psychological thing and I'm not an economist, but I'm convinced that economists should have a, a, a minor at least in psychology. Um, because when I see the ratings agencies like Moody all of a sudden saying, oh my gosh, the you know, we're going from uh, to a negative rating, um, it, be it can become a self-fulfilling pro um, prophecy. And that's, um, that's very unfortunate. And I, I hope that we don't see that. 
Dina, what, thank you. Go ahead, one Josh. One final thing just I, I meant to mention about Credit Suisse is, I mean, I know this is really coming to the fore now in the media today, for example, but really like this has been going on for quite some time. There have been, I mean, even in, this is kind of goofy to say, but even in like mom boards that I lurk on, you know, with like things like that, people have been saying that they're, you know, that Credit Suisse had, may have had some, um, some challenges going back months. Yeah. Josh, David, Dina, thanks. Lewis, I'd love to pivot to you if I could, um, you know, getting away a little bit from the banking conversation as if 2023 weren't chaotic enough. There's this, this palpable sense that regulatory um, actions are becoming more aggressive and more rapid fire. What are your perspectives on the current regulatory landscape? And let's like cut right to that chase and talk about the SEC as well. You know, I, and we have spoken to regulators. We, many of us know them and regulators hate the phrase regulation by enforcement. And I think some folks in the crypto space are going to put them on flags and start carrying regulation by enforcement on flags. Lewis, what's your perspective on, on, on that landscape right now? And where might we see that going? And then let's open that up to the group as well. Sure. Thank you, Ron. Um, you know, I'm not crazy about that, uh, that that term myself, regulation by enforcement. Um, it does get thrown around uh, quite a lot, but um, you know, mm -hmm. even the SEC uh, understands that that's a concern. And um, uh, we had found a, a great statement by the full commission uh, to House Financial Services back in 2000 uh, around the, the fair notice issue on uh, you know, disclosures and the uh, SEC told the House Financial Services that they thought about a regulation by enforcement approach but rejected that for um, uh, uh, Administrative Procedures Act APA rulemaking instead. So I think you know, there, there's some truth on both sides. I would say really the fact is that crypto just throws a monkey wrench into the current ways of looking at things. And you know, nobody seems to know quite what to do with it. Um, my view would be, and I think many of the enforcement staff have spoken to, is the one thing we could all agree on is go after bad actors. Bad actors are pretty plain where they are, and you know, the they are the ones that are creating the most difficulty. And then try and move forward with something that looks like thoughtful rulemaking that engages the the digital asset community and follows Administrative Procedures Act, you know, uh, policies of advance notice. And, uh, and and really just if that process had started, you know, two years ago, we'd probably be somewhere close to having a decent set of rules by now. It's, you know, at any point, it seems like, well, that takes way too long, but nevertheless, here we are. So I think, you know, everybody needs to, if I may say, chill out a little um, and just get back to basics. Let's Let's try and take as many bad actors out as we can prosecute those that we didn't discover, FTX or otherwise, and then do rulemaking in a way that is sensible and thoughtful. Lewis, thanks. David, Dina, Josh, one away in here. We have these conversations on a regular basis. David, in, in you particular, if I could, given where you sat outside in uh, within uh, an enterprise itself, what are your perspectives on, on regulation? And what are your perspectives on how the crypto industry hasn't helped itself vis-a-vis -vis regulation? That might be an interesting way to start. Uh, yeah. Another media well, question. <laughs> sure. In, in the first instance, with regard to what I, I agree with what Lewis said and focusing on, on the fraud element, I think the combination of the lack of rulemaking and the rhetoric that's kind of the tone that's come out of our regulators, you know, it's created this sort of situation where it's sort of an us versus them for people in the crypto space versus regulators. And it's playing out in, in many places. And for instance, in some of the bankruptcy cases we see, where like in the Voyager case, which is, you know, it's actually being litigated as we speak, you know, the government didn't put on evidence of why there may be issues that will precede the bankruptcy or, you know, go on with some of the transactions that are con being contemplated in the bankruptcy case. And they had every opportunity to do it and they hadn't done it. So I see the judiciary somewhat playing a role in sort of putting some, you know, feet to the fire a little bit about saying, you know, if you have evidence, you need to bring it. Or, you know, we can't rule based on supposition. And like broadening that out, I think what you're seeing is, you know, companies are told to go register. But what are they registering as? There is no path to register uh, right now for the things that, you know, that are being suggested. So I think what you're seeing is sort of, I'll take Lewis's point of like, you know, enforce the frauds. 
But I think the broader message is also that there needs to be something coherent that people can look towards. Because now the judiciary is saying, look, you don't have evidence, we're not gonna you know, side with you in that Voyager case. So it's really a dynamic process, but ultimately, I guess some of these cases will have to be tried, whether it be Ripple and others, and some case law developed if nothing comes out of Congress or you know, we don't see rulemaking from the regulators. David, thanks. I want to build on that a little bit if I could, and I want to open this up for Josh and Dina. And, and David, again, you and I have spoken about this many times. Um, the Voyager case, the bankruptcy, particularly the SEC objected to. And if I recall correctly, someone correct me if I'm wrong, the judge wasn't particularly impressed, as you noted, David, with the SEC's perspectives on why the bankruptcy shouldn't go through. And I think relatively shortly thereafter, the Department of Justice also weighed in. Someone want to paint that picture and tell us a little bit about what it looks like. David, do you want to start or Josh or Dina, you want to weigh in there as well? I will defer to others on that one. <laughs> I think what I would basically say is that the judge rejected the idea of this sort of things hanging out there that may be violations of law without the SEC or other federal regulators bringing evidence into his courtroom for him to judge on. Mm -hmm. And so what the DOJ is appealing is that there's an exculpation rule that is part of the bankruptcy process. And the SEC and the DOJ are you know, arguing that people shouldn't be uh, immunized from any actions they take as when they complete the bankruptcy plan. And the SEC and the DOJ are saying that they shouldn't have this immunity. And so this is the construct that's being appealed right now and right as we speak. As we speak. Maybe Josh, you can add from a not involved perspective. I mean, I think, David, I think you did a great job explaining that. I don't know that I could do it any better. So um, I did have, have a thought, though, about one of the other, other items that, that was talked about. Um, and it was um, actually, you know what, it's just escaped me. I'm sure it will come back in a second. But I just started thinking about the DOJ and some other things. Um, and now it has blown out of my mind. It, it'll come back, Josh. I, well, let's stick with you and then open it up for Lewis and the others as well. You know, oh, uh, I, I know what it was. I know what it was. OK, back to you. OK, all right. <laughs> for the audience, we do this very time. informally. <laughs> Go yes. ahead. So you know, in just thinking about what has been said about it, enforcement versus rulemaking, right? When we have seen regulators, for example, the SEC propose some kind of rulemaking, right? What have we seen? We've seen the proposed expansion of the definition of exchange, which some have described as almost like a Trojan horse that would affect, you know, the digital asset space. Then we've seen more recently the proposed expansion of the custody rule to be a safekeeping rule, which arguably takes the discretion out of whether a customer asset is a security or funds, right? It explicitly says the digital assets because it would be all customer assets would be covered by this. Now, one may think, okay, that's a, a step forward perhaps, but then if you think about, well, who is the natural, who is the natural beneficiary, no pun intended, of being a qualified custodian, you might think the banks. But then we know that there's been this new Fed Reserve rule, which says that member banks are presumptively prohibited from holding certain crypto assets. We've also seen, for example, the OCC back off of the, the fintech charters and actually say that national banks you know, need approval of the OCC to engage in crypto activities. So we saw the situation where SoFi months back wanted to acquire a national bank and as a condition of the OCC consent, SoFi had to stop doing crypto activities. We've also seen, and I'll cover this very fast, few years ago with Two Ocean, where Wyoming gave mm. a no action letter and also said, look, you know, Two Ocean can be a qualified custodian for purposes of the SEC's custody rule. And the SEC, I think two weeks later, fired back or so saying, actually, that's that's up for us to decide. So really, even as we're seeing rulemaking, which I, I applaud the idea of rulemaking, I think we have to have meaningful ways to move forward and to implement any any adopted rules. <clears throat> Josh, thanks for that. Uh, full disclosure, obviously, the latest SEC proposed rule is related to crypto and custodianship vis-a-vis uh, -vis advisors, I believe. WSBA will be responding to that. I think, Josh, I'm working with you and several others on this call uh, to feedback our comments to the SEC. I want to throw something out there that might be a little provocative, and it builds a little bit on, David, what you had noted, and I'm just throwing this out there for the, the whole group. We've often heard um, 
come in and register from the SEC. And I'm just going to say it at one point, there was a televis televised interview and the chair said, it's just a form on our website. And I know several heads just exploded uh, when he heard that. Lewis, is it just a form on their website? What are we talking about here? And why should the crypto industry ask for clarity regarding that? Well, it, it's a great question, Ron, and it really comes down to what is being registered. That's really the, the kind of the core question here. So there were actually a, a, a small number of registrations of uh, what they refer to as crypto asset securities. A couple of those were uh, uh, intentional securities. So, for example, INX, the Gibraltar-based exchange, um, created an exchange token, which was intended to be a security, and that was uh, registered on Form F1. Um, I'm sure it was a little bit more than just filling out a form on an exchange uh, but, uh, on, on, on the website, but um, uh, they did that. Um, uh, likewise, a, uh, a mutual fund uh, used Form N1, I believe it is, uh, it was a fund run by ARCA, but again, that was intended to be a security. Um, more interestingly, um, a couple of projects, I guess in 2019, uh, Blockstack and YouNow attempted to register as well, or not register technically speaking, but use Regulation A, which is the kind of light version of, of, of registration. So the IPO light, as it's often called. And uh, what they did was they were required by the SEC not only to register the offer and sale of the token, which is the transaction that constituted an investment contract transaction, but the SEC required them to actually register the security itself. And that's really where a lot of the confusion comes in. <laughs> the rules to, for, for registering an investment scheme are already sort of unclear because nobody had ever really done it before. Mm -hmm. But then creating, uh, trying to treat a token, which by itself is not a security, as a security, raises just all kinds of questions because, you know, for example, one of the things that uh, by the record when uh, the SEC went back and forth with issuer and issuer's counsel on is, are these tokens equity securities or debt securities? But they're not security, so it's really hard to answer that question. And so there was a lot of back and forth. And there are a lot of many other questions about different rules, proxy rules, all kinds of rules that just, you know, don't really make sense in this context. And so, um, you know, a number of players, but probably most notably Coinbase, uh, filed a rulemaking proposal and did a thorough job of going through just about every federal securities law that, that one could imagine and said, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And really, I think, did the hard work of saying to the SEC, it's not just about go on the website and fill out a form. There's just a lot of things that we don't know, you know, how you're, you, you expect these to be treated. So I think that's that's really, it is, I think many people fail, and I would say reasonably that it was disingenuous. I mean, I could, I, I could comment on that. Go for it. So, um, so, you know, I didn't um, go into the SEC over and over and over. I just met with the uh, principals um, with some of my clients and um, I happened to attract like registered um, ADSs and broker dealers that wanted to use, uh, you know, digital assets for liquidity reasons. Um, and so um, we had been trying to get clarity back in 2017. And um, we tried to, um, we knew that this, we were actually saying we were concerned about regulation by enforcement, but people were really confused about the technology versus what the technology does. And in a very short amount of time, the market by September of that year was at $3 trillion. And there was no easy way for the SEC to pull its way out of this without getting blamed um, for it or for um, the market, you know, a market type of event or getting, um, or um, what I was gonna say, retail investors, uh, um, losing money, and I'm forgetting what my train of thought was, but my point is that the SEC, um, I would call them kind of smoke signals. They were like sending out so smoke signals, like, right? you know, all these, and they tried to pick things with, that were less liquid, that wouldn't impact a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, um, either the smoke signals weren't heard or some maybe chose to like ignore the smoke signals and um, and now today, um, digital assets 
um, or crypto is in every part of the financial services ecosystem, which makes it much harder to regulate or in terms of fraud, uh, clean up. So I think the biggest mistake well, was- you know what you mean by smoke signals, just to help us better understand- what you, call, what you call regulation by enforcement, rather than taking a bold move, the SEC became afraid that they were gonna either hurt um, the crypto markets or that they were going to hurt the retail investors more than the founders themselves. So this ad hoc sort of crazy announcements with two different commissioners, um, cause they didn't know how to get their way out of it without looking like they were the problem, um, kept going on. And in the meantime, um, crypto, um, found its way into, you know, all sorts of other types of financial transactions. And that's very unfortunate, but what I would say where the industry messed up is at some point, not pivoting to just amending financial services, regulations or laws. Is it fair to push that on the industry though? And I'm not necessarily trying to take that side, Dean. I mean, let's be fair. The SEC had an opportunity to engage in some level of safe harbor and a new administration basically seemed to dismiss that out of hand. Is there credence to that perspective? Josh, go ahead. I mean, so I, I do think that there is, I wouldn't lay the blame, you know, Entirely on either. Or entirely. Right. Yeah. But, but what I would say is I think that as an industry and as, um, as council and as others, as people, you know, there are certain things that are clear, right? And I think we should acknowledge, in my view, that they're clear. If you want a capital raise, if you want to do a traditional capital raise, but substitute a token, we know how to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we know how to do that, but there are ish, there are areas that we definitely need clarity about, some of which um, I, Lewis mentioned in terms of um, Coinbase's rulemaking proposal. I thought that that did a great job teasing out a lot of questions. Some things, for example, just specifically, okay, so if a digital asset trading platform becomes an ATS, what happens to the rest of the tokens that it can no longer list, right? Because it can't do its due diligence on tokens that may not have been issued in compliance with securities laws, if the SEC deems those tokens to be securities. So we don't have an answer for that piece. And I think to the extent that we as an industry can say like, okay, we've got this part covered. I think that will help us instead of constantly, um, I, and I'm exaggerating here a little bit for effect on the panel, but you know, repeatedly saying there's absolutely no clarity because we do have clarity about some things. Fair point. I, but here's what I would say, um, and I am agreeing with you in a different way, is, um, you know, for me, most of what I saw in terms of ICOs, not every single one um, was an offering combined with a promise of a future good or service. Um, you know, that doesn't exist today. That's okay. My view was um, we had a new SEC chair um, and that um, Chairman Clayton, who was very open to uh, making it easier to raise capital. We had a Republican Congress and um, there was a great opportunity, especially one of the biggest issues is accredited investor for sure. And um, I think um, being so against financial regulation, even if it's changing that regulation, I, I think at some, at some point the industry needed to pivot. Thank, thank you all. I, you know, keep the questions coming, folks. We've got them queuing up in the Q&A. I want to hit on one of the points there as well. And Josh, you had mentioned there are some aspects of it that are clear. There are some aspects from a regulatory perspective in the SEC that could use some of the clarity. Can we, I'd like to look at a specific case if we can. And you all remember the, the insider trading case that the SEC brought against several tokens being listed on Coinbase. I think it was eight or nine of 25. I guess my, the broad question for a non-lawyer is why? And where, what happened to that clarity? Um, and why, why not the other 18 or 19? Or why those nine specifically? And, and for a lot of the industry participants, just saying how we test doesn't really help. Louis, do you want to kind of start that off a little bit? Maybe we go around to the rest of the group. And David, I love your perspectives as well. Sure. Um, I mean, it is difficult. Prosecutorial discretion is a very legitimate thing. Um, you know, I think for those of us who look at these tokens and say, I don't see a security there, fair enough. But if you look at the token, if you imagine, 
what uh, Mr. Wahi and his accomplices did was trade Apple shares, you know, illegally or, you know, get insider information and do that, then you'd say, of course, the SEC, uh, you know, should enforce that. If he did a lot of different things and they chose nine of 25, well, you know, maybe that was the time they had available to present their case there. You know, there, there are perfectly legitimate reasons for using prosecutorial discretion. Um, it is very difficult to know in the specifics of, of the case against Mr. Wahi, do, do, is that because they thought the other, whatever that number is, uh, the seven, six, whatever, <laughs> math is bad, you know, did they think those were not securities or they just did not have time to develop the case? You know, we just don't know. That's not public information. And to some extent, it's probably less relevant. I think what's really most relevant, and, and a, a number of firms have submitted amicus briefs on this question is, well, were these securities or were these not securities? That is a legal matter that a court can, should, and must decide. Um, we submitted one uh, together with a client of ours, uh, Paradigm, a, a large VC fund in the space, but there are a number of great ones. Um, I think a number of the other trade associations submitted briefs. And I think that's a decision that just you know has to be addressed. Uh, so I think you get to the why nine out of 25 really only after you answer the first question, well, are we dealing with securities or are we not? Obviously, our view is that well, we are not, but though reasonable people can differ about that. Lewis, thanks. David, anything you want to add to that? And let's go around the horn as well. Yeah. I'll just add quickly that it was very important that entities like the one Lewis represented and others weighed in on the status of the tokens that were alleged to be securities, because these particular plaintiffs were unlikely to defend those issues and really focus on whether they had insider traded or not. And leaving those issues aside without being defended would have left maybe either you know, a default judgment or just a ruling that they were sort of securities by the lack of the facts or circumstances that were argued that they weren't. So it was very important for the industry to come in and argue why they felt that those tokens weren't securities so that they were adequately defended in this proceeding. David, thanks. Josh, go ahead. So I, I've always thought that maybe the the tokens that were sig signaled out without taking any view as to whether they were or were not securities, because I haven't examined all of them, that, you know, in some instances, um, it could be that the SEC was trying to provide different fact patterns, you know, different types of tokens that then, as I feel, in my view, has been part of the strategy in terms of what enforcement comes next, like each one potentially has a, a teaching um, moment associated with it, but I would say, you know, this this bringing a an action against um, a party while sort of assuming that another fact exists or that another found a, another legal determination has been made. We've just seen something very similar, although certainly different regulator, um, but with the New York AG, right, bringing that case against KuCoin and alleging, among other things, that ETH. Um, is a security, right? So people have been wondering what happens. I mean, we've seen, I believe with the Canadian case that KuCoin didn't respond and that there was a default judgment. Could we see the same thing in New York? And, you know, to what extent, you know, could that affect, you know, while the SEC is trying to figure out whether whether ETH is likely to be a security or whether people believe, whether Gensler, I should, Chairman Gensler believes that, that ETH is a security and people are trying to sort of read the tea leaves, including um, in that, recent New York MAG article, yeah. right? The New York AG seems to have, you know, jumped forward and, and we'll see what happens with, with the outcome of that case. Josh, on that point, I think all five of us have been around long enough to remember uh, sufficiently decentralized. Um, and does, does anyone have clarity on how the New York AG has called, how and why they've called it? Can, can, I, just, can I just break that? in with a little Please. bit of breaking news? So the Voyager opinion is out, apparently. Just okay. moments. I just put it into the chat. So you, I think, Gron, you could probably move it so all the panelists, but sorry to interrupt, but uh, just very topical. So well-timed panel. So uh, I, I think we're all going to have to read it, but uh, that's going to prove uh, very interesting. I, I will share that with all for the audience. Please uh, click in and read that. Uh, David, I'm sure you and I and all of us will be chatting about that uh, a little bit later on. On the ETH thing real quickly, and, and I feel like I can't believe we're almost 45 minutes through. Does anyone have knowledge of why the New York Attorney General weighed in specifically on ETH being a security in the wake of 2018 and Hinman and appropriately or sufficiently decentralized? Is there any clarity on that yet or no? I mean, there's no, 
so I, I will talk from the political side. Um, my sense from going into senior uh, level meetings with, uh, you know, different people that weren't necessarily lobbying is, um, is that that the SEC and some of the other regulators um, were trying to get this industry regulated, which is a high hurdle because you got to become a national exchange if you're, uh, uh, generally speaking, for a security um, that is offered to an, a non-accredited investor. And I think that um, at some point, because of not just those issues, but national security issues, dollar as the reserve currency, anti-money laundering, that the industry that um, the administration valued the underlying technology, but started to work with um, traditional finance companies. Dina, thanks. Thanks very much, David. I'd like to go to you. We've got a bunch of questions coming in. We'll reserve the last five or eight minutes for it. David, I'm going to just throw it out there again, buddy. You and I have talked about this, and it might be more provocative than I mean it to be. For crypto folks who've gotten involved that are technologists and not attorneys, they've probably heard Howie Test and Reeves and Prongs and all of this stuff way too much in their lives, as important as it is. Is it time to revisit Howie? Is it time to revisit what we mean by a security in the wake of the innovations that we're seeing with blockchain and crypto assets? You can even slap on AI at some point. David, kick us off. Uh, I'd love your kind of philosophic perspective on that. You know, I, I have a lot of views on it, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to give Lewis the first bite of this apple. <laughs> Since he's done a lot of writing on it, I want to- Hunted give, on a question. <laughs> I want to, rarely will I do that, but I want to give Lewis the first bite of this apple. Mr. Well, Cohen, old friend, go for it. That's very kind of you, David. I'll keep it super short because I know we're very uh, uh, limited on time and everybody's going to have uh, terrific views on this. I, you know, my personal view um, is that the Howey test is just fine, that it's being improperly applied, that, you know, in, in and of itself, you know, when the cases are read and, and the sort of the thinking behind it uh, works, you know, it's, I think, something Josh and you and Dean have both alluded to, you know, it, it is trying to prevent people from fundraising by working around disclosure rules that are intended to give the retail public adequate information when they fundraise. That is what the Howey test is about. And when applied appropriately, that is what it addresses. I think where the issue arises, in my view, Ron, is when it's extended to something that it does not apply to and is not intended to apply to, and that is a specific asset that does not have the characteristics of a security. Lewis, thanks so much. Josh, Dina, David, anything? I'll just give a quick comment because I have to jump off in a couple minutes. Yep. But um, as many of you know, I worked on the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, which made it easier for companies to raise capital in the public markets, as well as just importantly in the private markets. When I worked on that, um, I realized after we passed it that even though it made a huge change, that um, the laws were still antiquated. And so I really uh, think that the 33, the 34, the 40 Act, I, I think these things need to be amended, um, either through regulation or legislation, um, to match the, fi the fact that we're not tra trading pieces of paper on the streets. Are you going to lay odds on how how that happens or when that happens, Dina? No, it's not. Uh, it's you know not not in this environment. It's not going to happen. Um, in a different environment, it would have. Maybe in the future, but banking, I mean, banking law change over and over and over again. Yep. But securities law, which I'm not saying it doesn't work, I think it could use some improvements. Dina, thanks so much. Appreciate yeah, that. I, I know you got to hop as well. Really appreciate it, Dina. Thank um, you very much to all of you. You got it. Josh, David, if we could, do you have perspectives on that? And I, I want to kind of wrap it up with kind of a future forward thinking perspective. But Josh, David, anything to add to Dino or Lewis's comments on, on how we securities and evolving this legislation? So I guess my view is, um, I think by itself, I don't have an issue with the Howey test. I, I think I'm open to different possibilities in the future. But in the absence of having something comprehensive that can really, I mean, one of the good things with principles-based rules is that there's a lot of flexible application as you go along and as things change. I think we've seen outside of the US, um, a country recently, or an area of the world, I can't even think of which one, spent a lot of time working on a very detailed AI law that is now outmoded yep. <laughs> already. And so I, I think that's one of, the, one of the risks that we run. 
So I think um, that's my thought. You know, I kind of look at it sort of in a futurist tone. And, and my view is that, you know, we have a lot of tokens that have value that are not currently listed as securities or thought of as securities. If tokens that are currently in the ecosystem are relegated or be determined to be securities, you could erode billions of dollars of value in, in these tokens. And while I think there can be some philosophical disputes on what, what tokens may or may not be securities, and I think the majority of us have a view on them not being securities, the idea that you could lose you know, $100 billion of value by taking tokens that have been not been considered securities and label them securities is something that really has to be considered both for the ecosystem, for regular individuals using the protocols, and for you know, people who want to use these protocols in the future. So I think my takeaway is that we need to come up with a regime so this can flourish in the US, or we will likely see the majority of projects move offshore or move as much as they can offshore. Are we falling behind? Is that the perspective for the U.S.? I'd, Lewis, I'd love your thoughts, and let's get into a small enough group. Um, are yeah, we falling I, I, behind? I, I don't know. At this point in time, it's fair to say the United States is falling behind, but we are at risk of driving technologists offshore, and we're certainly starting to see we're eroding the, the immense advantage that we have, and if left unchecked, we will, uh, we, we will absolutely uh, put ourselves behind, yes. Lewis, thanks very much. I want to give it one more question and then address some of the Q&A coming from members. I, and I want this to be your takeaway perspectives. What, what are you telling industry, your industry colleagues, industry crypto industry participants, what should they focus on going forward? And what are your thoughts about the future? A lot of storm clouds seem to be gathering. But Josh, I'd love to start with you. We have this conversation on a regular basis. What are you telling people that are involved in the crypto industry and what should they be prepared for? So it's a great question. I'm telling them a lot of things, but I think maybe I'll take a more positive view here for a moment. Just say in many ways, this potentially is crypto's time to shine. I mean, mm. not that we give investment advice or anything like that, but you know, Bitcoin's up this week and it's to me, no surprise. I mean, for a long time, Caitlin Long, Andrea Tiniano, the people on this call, you know, people have always been taught, the creators of Bitcoin, creator of Bitcoin, whoever that may be, Satoshi Nakamoto, you know, has been warning about the dangers of, or the, not dangers, but the risks of fractionalized reserve banking, right? And crypto solves for this. I think what I'm telling people is, look, whether it comes to laws or technologies or whatever, we're known for innovation. Let's innovate this. Josh, thanks so much. David? So I would say a couple of things. First of all, I agree with Josh. And then also I would say, you know, I am bullish running our crypto assets working group, uh, you know, I am bullish on the long-term prospects for crypto and the use cases and the development of the ecosystem. Um, I, you know, I do worry about this bifurcation taking place where, you know, the U.S. won't be the first choice of developing new initiatives and new projects. And I, I would just say as a cautionary tale, you know, look at what happened with USDC. USDC fully funded one of the banks where their cash deposits are located suddenly has issues and, it, and USDC loses its DPEG. It gets DPEG because one of the banks where they keep their you know, fiat US dollars suddenly becomes unstable. So I see the irony in that and, and the value of crypto and what it can create and going forward. So it, there's, a lot, there's a lot more to be, a lot more to the story that uh, needs to be written but I do see the resilience of crypto through this. I feel like all of this is on the deep end of the pool and we can keep going. Lewis, what are you saying to people? What are your thoughts about the future for crypto industry participants and how should they look at it? Yeah, I, I share David's optimism and, and Josh's as well. Um, I, I think you know, the best measure is by looking at the kinds of people that are still moving into crypto. You know, And, and I think while it is beyond you know, reprehensible, some of the events that occurred, you know, in 2022. Um, the fact is that that has not deterred builders and creative people, computer scientists, cryptographers. Um, the, the, the world is pushing back on the relationship between the individual and government. 
and and that resonates very very strongly that's not changing you know i sometimes analogize crypto to the printing press like once you have that you're you're not undoing it how it gets used and maybe for good or for bad can change over time you know but it's not going away and it really resonates with individuals and so it's very difficult uh, for any government anywhere to tell people you can't do crypto. Th th this is very important to far too many people. So I think it's exciting to see the good projects build. We all have a responsibility, whether you call it gatekeepers or just our, our internal moral compasses, mm -hmm. we're good projects and not bad. But I, I, have, I have no you know, concern or anxiety, uh, naysayers on uh, LinkedIn and, uh, and Twitter notwithstanding. I think mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, yeah. The builders keep building and you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? Right, Lewis? Let's get to some of the questions that we've got. And I realize we've only got a couple of minutes. And, and our dear friend, Andrea, actually posted out there, perhaps there should not be fractional reserve banking for some clients. They could pay more. I feel that's like its own webinar. So, Andrea, expect a phone call. But does anyone want to weigh in on that? I mean, it's dangerous to rely on fractional reserve deposits. And we've just seen a few examples of that. Look, I mean, fundamentally... There is going to be a need for greater liquidity at banks with the rapidity of, of withdrawals and the ability for people en masse to withdraw on short notice. So this is a structural issue that we're going to have to address. Um, so, I mean, that is a takeaway uh, from this, you know, that we've yeah. had our, literally, we've had our first digital bank run. Yeah. And it's 15 years, uh, yesterday was 15 years from Bear Stearns. The timing couldn't be worse or more impeccable. Um, Let's see, our friend Richard Johnson. Hello, friends. Do you agree with Barney Frank that Signature got taken down because of crypto? I'm going to let the three of you have at it on that one. <laughs> no? No. Yeah. And, and NYDFS said it, essentially, right? It, it, that was one uh, the New York DFS said, Josh, was not related to crypto, correct? Right. I mean, well, they listen, so, <laughs> you know, we never know what's going on in people's minds, right? And we never know to what extent there may have been already plans or concerns separate from this. It's just, you know, what we've seen is a narrative that wraps the, the, three, the three entities together, right, in the media. But we don't know what was actually in the minds of the regulators. Louis, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, no, agreed. I mean, I think, you know, the, the ostensible reason was an anticipatory attempt to stop a, a, a bank run. And it's a little bit like future crime. It's like, well, there could have been a bank run, so we're going to shut you down. That's a lot of value destruction, in my mind, yeah. for a hypothetical, like, well, is there a bank run? The other thing I just quickly will get in, Ron, uh, yeah. which from the earlier part of the discussion where we started, and we didn't just have time for it, is a question that many people are asking, which is uh, specifically to um, uh, SDB, but also to some of the others, uh, uh, the two others that failed as well, is where was the, 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 the Fed's uh, discount window? in all this they had a right. lot of even if they were not able to be sold at par and they were going to take a loss they could have been sold at the you know, or repoed at the discount window at par which yeah. is what the fed wound up doing anyway and not have a run not shut down the bank and not destroy a great deal of shareholder value and i think that will undoubtedly be explored over time as to how that you know was it that the fed just didn't point this out and because my understanding is when the fed points that out you do it or did the bank not ask but either way um it seems like this was avoidable value destruction. And I think there's gonna be a lot to answer for there. Lewis, Josh, David, thank you so much. We're at time, we can keep going on. There's so much to discuss here. We're grateful for your thought leadership, really do appreciate it. For those members in the audience who joined us, this recording will be available in a couple of weeks. Our next event is on bankruptcy claims trading on the 29th. If you folks can join us, that will be great. Otherwise we're gonna leave it there. Again, Josh, David, Lewis, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Take care. Thank you. Great to see you everybody.